We're gonna restore this Winchester Model 1873 and we're gonna start right after we roll the intro. The idea for this video series came about as a result of another restoration video that I did a while back where I restored a 1930 Browning Auto 5 shotgun. That video has turned out to be one of my best performing videos. I received a lot of comments, a lot of likes, uh, so I thought I'd try and do something similar to that with, with, with this gun. I'll post a link to it right up here so you can go watch that video if, you, if you'd like. We're going to do this one differently. That Auto 5 video was a compilation of work that I did over several months that I brought them all together at the end and made this beginning to end video showing the work, showing the beginning, the, the before and the after uh, as I did the work and then letting you see what, what, the, what, the, what the shotgun looked like at the very end. This one, we're actually going to start from the very beginning and we're going to show the process step by step from beginning to end. So in this series, what I want to do is talk about restoration, talk about restoration philosophy. And, and, in, this, and in this series, I also want to relate some of the history. Now, not necessarily the history of the firearm, because there's a lot of stuff out on the internet right now. There's a lot of books that talk about the 1873, its history, how it was used. What I want to do is go and look at what was it like to work in a factory in the 1880s, and how did the technology of the day affect not only not only the look of the gun, but the materials and, and, and how the quality was built into the gun and, and what, those, what those experiences of the workers were while they were building these, these firearms. Now, before we begin to do the physical work on, on the gun, we're going to take a deep dive into the current condition of this rifle. We're going to look at, at the gun from one end to the other, and we're going to look at its, its condition, the condition of the wood, the condition of the metal, how, how many of the parts are, are reusable or restorable, and we're going to look really deep at it, and we're going to try to decipher the actual history that the gun is telling us from its years of existence. But before we do this, I want to talk about another subject, and that subject is, it's only original once. But before we have that discussion, I'm going to pull the 1873 out, and I'm going to bring in some older Winchesters, and I want to talk through what makes those firearms special in their original condition. So, in the restoration business, there are only so many opportunities to get it right, but there are so many more opportunities to get it wrong. And one of the questions that we ask is, if we're going to restore something, what are we going to restore it to? Or to restore it to what? Everything has history, and nearly everything that we restore has that history embedded into the object itself. And because of that, we have to ask ourselves, how far are we willing to go? How much of that history are we willing to forego or to make disappear for future generations? So to talk through some of the concerns that, that we have before we, before we start ripping and tearing into these things is to look at the condition or general overall condition of the firearm. But it's not only just looking at the condition, it's looking at the condition of multiple firearms from the same era. Because by looking at multiple examples and then understanding what they, what they did look like, what they should look like, how badly they're worn or how badly the patina has settled into these firearms, then we get to think about, well, how much work should we do? Now, oftentimes, folks will bring, bring these old firearms into our shop and ask us to do a restoration. And when they do, many times we'll, we'll recommend that they just leave the gun alone, that they don't touch it, that they don't do the restoration. That by doing the restoration, they're going to change things like the history of that firearm, but they're also going to change the, the, the value of that firearm. Because firearms with, with really good, rich history 
are going to be worth more, not only for their history, but for their physical dollar values, because as soon as you change that original condition or state of, of the firearm, it is worth different amounts of money or different money. So I have four examples here that I want to want to show you. And when we look at these four examples, these three that are closest to, to the camera are unrestored. These are original condition Winchesters. This one closest to me is a full restoration, but I want to talk about that one different and special because this is not a restoration. This quite literally is something that, that in the car industry you might call a resto mod. And I'll tell you why I took it to that level when we get to that firearm. Now this first Winchester is a Model 1892 and 38 Winchester Centerfire. It was manufactured or built in 1901. It's a very old Winchester. But when we look at the patina, when we look at, when we look at the history, this gun is in really nice, nice shape. The finish is worn in all the correct places. It's where you would expect that bluing to have been worn off. But it's not worn so far that the gun doesn't retain any of its original condition. There's no pitting. The, 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 the metal is in really good shape. So to, to touch that, all right, would, would obviously be the, the choice of the owner, but we would discourage this owner from, from doing any work to this gun because in its condition, that history, that patina is so vibrant that we would ask, why do you even want to do this restoration? Now, when we look at the wood, however, we see an entirely different problem because the wood on this gun has been refinished sometime in its past. In fact, it's been repaired. There's, there's a pin here. Um, there's, there's discoloration where there should be no discoloration. It's a blonder color when it shouldn't be. And you can see when you look at the finish, this is not an original finish that Winchester would have used back in the day. They would have either used a shellac or they would have used some kind of a varnish. And this is not that. So somewhere in this gun's history, this gun stock has been refinished. But does it make it any less valuable? No, not at all. Because that is part of the gun's history. That is part of the changes that occurred to that firearm. Is it ugly? Nope. Did they damage the gun? Nope. But is it original? No. This rifle has a half octagon, half round barrel, and it has the correct buckhorn sight. All the screws are in excellent condition. All the slots are pointed properly. No, there's very little wear in those slots. The amount of bluing is, is really excellent for for the year of the gun, 1901, and for the amount of years that this gun has spent in somebody's collection. It was well cared for. Again, that's part of the gun's history. The only thing that may have uh, some wear would be this, this butt plate, this crescent butt plate. The, all the finish has, has come off that butt plate. Does that change anything? No. Am I going to put bluing on that? No, I'm just going to leave that alone. The next three Winchesters are all Model 1894s. But, like this original one, they're all very old. So this first 1894 is a 32 Winchester Special, but it's a takedown model. I'll show you that here in a little bit. It was manufactured in 1901, just like the 92. This one is even more incredible in its original state. It has this Winchester manufactured rear sight that is totally unique in that you don't see this typically on a lot of these old, old Winchesters. But it says right on it, man, manufactured by Winchester. The patina on this has gone into a really nice brownish color, which, which is really striking in, in itself. All the screws are the same. They're all well pointed. They, all, they are not worn or dung up. This gun stock has the original finish on it. Has lots and lots of dings in it, which is good history because it sort of shows us that this gun was used but not abused. There's wear in this area up in here, and this wear is due to the fact that it's a takedown rifle. You would expect to see that there 
because when this gun is dismantled or taken apart, that wear is a result of unscrewing the latch that holds that, that barrel in place. The stock does have some, some chips in the corner. On a Winchester of this age, you don't, you don't expect not to see that on some, some number of these firearms. So, would I go in and repair that? I could. I could, but if I did that, I'd be erasing some of that history. And the overall condition of this gun is so high that I then begin to question, why would I want to go and try to spend time doing a repair on a little broken corner as opposed to just leaving it as a firearm that tells its history for all those years since 1901. This is a nice example. The patina is all right. The, 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 the wood patina is, is correct. The finish is correct. It has, on the wood has all the wear in all the correct places. This is a nice example of this. The next one to look at is also in 1894. This one's in 3240. It was manufactured in 1911. In no respects are any of these guns in like new condition, and I'm not sure that I'd want them in like new condition. There's a couple reasons. One, the price for those kind of guns goes through the roof. It becomes astronomical. It becomes unaffordable for the average person. But for me, as a historian, when you take away all that history, or when that gun has no history, it has no history. It's just sat around in somebody's rack somewhere for the last hundred and some odd years. I like a gun that tells a story. I like a gun that has wear in all the correct, correct places. I like a gun that shows what it's lived for its life. Same thing, the bluing is, is, is really in good shape on this firearm. The receiver has all the wear in all the correct places. In other words, when this gun was carried out in, in the woods or wherever it was used, that hand grabbed this receiver and either a gloved hand or, or a bare hand, it takes away the bluing. That's what I expect to see. I expect to see wear here. And sometimes I expect to see wear along the top of the barrel. This gun has some unique features. This gun has a folding front sight. This gun has the traditional buckhorn sights, but this gun also has this marble sight that is original to the Winchester, original to the gun, because a lot of these guns came out of the factory with these sights installed. So between the peep sight back here and this hooded sight in the front, this makes this gun unique. I'm not sure it makes it particularly valuable, but it does add value to it and it does add to the history. Lots of dings in this, in this wood, lots of, lots of dings. There's no chips in the corner. All, all of the inletting is, is pristine. It's all as it should be. The color of the wood is, is the reddish tint that would go into these firearms when they were new. The wear, is, is, the wear in the patina is, is nearly, is, it's just beautiful. Somebody could bring this in and ask that we restore it. Would we? We would, because they own the firearm. Would we try and discourage it? We would, because again, you begin to erase all that history. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, what's that history worth? What's it worth to you? What's it worth to the gun? What's it worth to, its, to the future generation that may, at some time, possess this firearm? And the last one I want to talk about is this short carving, this, this uh, model 1894 uh, in 3030. Uh, again, this one was manufactured in 1911 as well. I bought this gun 35, 40 years ago, and I paid $50 for it. And I bought it because it was junk. It was trash. There wasn't anything about it that was redeeming or that could be saved for its history. The thing was rusted, it was pitted. It had issues from, from muzzle to butt. 
In fact, the gun stock itself, both the forearm and the buttstock, were in such poor condition with cracks and breaks and chips. Uh, it had been refinished sometime in its past. There was nothing that I could save to make this thing feel that it would retain any value in its current state or push any of that value forward into the, into the future. So for me, because the gun was in such poor condition, I sort of went down the path of customizing this Winchester. And I didn't feel guilty about it because there was, again, nothing redeeming about the gun in its condition that I purchased it in. Whereas these first three, I won't touch them because the history is so vibrant. It's so alive there. This is a beautiful firearm. All of the, all of the metal was restored. I hand filed all of the pitting, all of the scale out of all of that metal. It was a lot of work and it was time consuming. All the while that I'm doing that, I'm trying to preserve what history I could, for instance, all the roll marking. I didn't want to affect the roll marking. So I worked hard not to file away that roll marking. I did a higher finish on the metal, which means we did something we call color buffing, which is to bring that polish up to a higher level so that when we blued it, that its reflection was was mirror-like. I did the same with the wood. I hand-built these gun stocks. I didn't go and find used gun stocks. I didn't go find some reproduction gun stock. I hand-built each of those from a block of wood, and I was able to choose some of the most gorgeous American walnut that I could find so that I could customize this carbine and then not only to customize it, but to give it a, a, a more modern flair using modern materials, modern bluing, modern finishes, modern, modern um, techniques for constructing it. And it's a beautiful firearm. It will never be able to be sold as an original Winchester, nor would I hope to ever try and do that. But could I sell it for what it is, a resto mod? Yes, I could. Would it bring its own value? I would hope so. So it's only original once. I, I run into these same discussions with the military firearms collectors, guys that do M1s, M1 Grands. Uh, same with the uh, military vehicle collectors and, and in fact even auto collectors or car collectors. Uh, these discussions happen all the time. And I'm sure some of what I'm saying is even going to piss some people off, but it's only original once. So if an M1 Grand went through an entire, entire life in, in war or in other, in other conditions, these things oftentimes got dismantled, brought to depot, restored, rebuilt, and then, and then parts were put together that weren't original to that gun's manufacturer. So a lot of collectors will spend lots of time trying to collect the correct parts for, say, a, a Saginaw or, or, a, um, or a Singer or a Winchester or whatever number of, of manufacturers. And I don't fault that. I don't find that wrong. But what I would suggest is that before you make those decisions that you think about at least the fact that every part from another manufacturer that got put into that gun is a part of that gun's history. So we can even say the same thing for, for military Jeeps or the old, or the, the old Jeeps. I, I'm, I'm a collector of, of old Jeeps. I have a passion for these old things. But I also kind of look at those in the same respect, that these old Jeeps have their own history. So you get some of these old flat fender Jeeps from the, from the 40s and 50s. These things had their own life. They had their own history. And to go back and to do a complete gut and tear and put on things like aftermarket bodies and all of this stuff. I'm not telling you it's wrong, I'm just saying it's not by definition a restoration. Or it's not a restoration in its purest sense because it doesn't try to retain or, or maintain or keep the history. 
I have a good friend of mine who's a judge in the Mustang Club, and, and he judges in the survivor class. His knowledge of original Mustangs is voluminous. He knows so much, but he literally will look at things like, does it have an original gasket? And then if you go and replace that original gasket, did you replace that original gasket with another original gasket? Because it's only original once. So thinking about restorations and thinking about how you do a restoration really depends on the outcome that you're looking for, or as I suggested in, in the beginning of this video, is restore it to what? It's a valid question. It's a, it's a real question. It's a real way to think about restoration in philosophy. The next time we come back, we're going to actually do the deep dive into, into this Winchester. Uh, we're going to look at its condition. We're going to try to pick out as many of those issues or, or problems with the gun that need to be resolved. And we'll talk through them and we'll figure out how we're going to deal with them. But we're also going to talk a little bit about knowing things about doing research and understanding how this gun was built originally that will aid us in figuring out how to deal with the restoration moving forward. So I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got something out of it. This is a fascinating subject, restorations and, and restoration philosophy. And I've got a lot more that I'd like to share with you. And I, and I hope you come back and allow me to share it with you. So thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, and I'll see you in the next one.